I'm Alan, and it's great to be with you after what has been an incredible week in sports. And if you are a fan of the NFL, you're probably confused because they're still in preseason. If you're a college football fan, you have no idea what I'm talking about because they have not started yet. If you're a Major League Baseball fan, you're thinking, yes, they're just 300 games into their 500 game season. No, I'm talking about the world's greatest sport, which is known as soccer. And it's been an incredible week if you were a soccer fan because last week the English Premier League started back, which is probably the world's greatest league, and it has some of the world's top names in soccer, and they're back in full swing, and there's some wonderful matches this past week. Last night was the League's Cup final. It was the first ever of its kind. The League's Cup is a combination of all of the teams from the Mexican Professional League and the Professional League that's in the United States. They all came together, and they made one big giant tournament, and last night was the finals, and it went to 11 shots for penalty shoots. And so penalty shootout, they, they take kicks at the end of the game is tied, they do PKs, and it got down to the 11th kick taker. They got so deep in their lineup, the goalkeepers both took shots. That was the last play of the game was one goalkeeper shooting on another goalkeeper. So it was incredible. So I stayed up till about midnight watching that last night. And then this morning at 6 a.m., the Spanish women's national team and the English women's national team played in the World Cup final, which was also an incredible match. And all of these are different, they're different genders, and the World Cup was played in Australia, the League's Cup was played in Nashville, and of course the English Premier League is played all over England. But there is a commonality that I found watching all of these sports this past week, and it is in the pregame commentary. Before each pregame, before each game, there's pregame commentary, and the announcers take us through the starting lineup. And there's two things that happen when they go through the starting lineup for, regardless of the level of soccer, really regardless of the sport, they're going to go through the starting lineup, and they're going to read off names like Martin Odegaard, Lionel Messi. These are household brand name soccer players. When you read them in the starting lineup, no one says, Really? They're in there. It'd be like if you were reading a starting lineup in the NBA and you saw a LeBron James name on there. You're not going to be surprised that they are on the starting lineup. But the same thing happens. It doesn't matter the sport. It doesn't matter the level. They'll get to a part in the commentary when they're reading through the starting lineup and they'll come across a player that perplexes them just a little bit. They think, I wonder why that player was included. I know why the name brand players were included. I know why they're on the roster, but in reading through this starting lineup, couldn't they have chosen somebody different? Couldn't they have picked somebody better for that particular spot? But the coach saw something in that player and chose to put them into the starting lineup anyways. And that very much is the heart behind Matthew chapter nine, which is what we're going to study this morning. And so, if you wanna pull out your red pew Bibles in front of you, pull out your phones. We're gonna go through all of Matthew chapter nine this morning, and you'll find that the central theme of Matthew chapter nine is that there's a lot of surprises on the list of who Jesus would include in his kingdom. It'd be really obvious for us to see the religious elites. You would, of course, think the Pharisees of the day, the religious leaders of the day, of course they made the cut. They do all of the right things, but what we'll find throughout Matthew chapter nine is included in the roster are players that you would not think would be there. It begins here in Matthew chapter nine, verse one. <clears throat> it says this, it says Jesus stepped into a boat, crossed over and came to his own town. Some men brought him a paralyzed man lying on a mat. Some men brought him a paralyzed man lying on a mat. The man could not get to Jesus himself, he was helpless. He had no way of even getting into the presence of Jesus on his own. Very easily forgotten, very easily passed by. And this is what Jesus says. He says, when Jesus saw their faith, so he's crediting the people that are carrying him, not only the paralyzed man, but also the men carrying him with faith. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the man, take heart, son, your sins are forgiven. And here's the first color commentary that we get from the Pharisees. You're gonna see this red thread throughout Matthew chapter nine. The commentators are wondering, why is that person included? And that's what we get in verse three. At this, some teachers of the law, Pharisees, religious leaders, it's gonna use those interchangeably. Some teachers of the law said, this fellow is blaspheming. And here's what they're mad about. They're mad that Jesus has chosen to forgive this man his sins. They're mad that Jesus is actually proclaiming to be God in that statement. 
Because Jesus in saying your sins are forgiven is saying, I am God. Only God can forgive sins. And so he's, Jesus is making this public statement through this healing by saying, your sins are forgiven. And so they're mad at Jesus anyways for overstepping his boundaries. Jesus is supposed to just be a teacher at this point. And they're kind of fine with him traveling around, but they really don't want him being in charge of who gets to get in and who is not allowed to be in. But Jesus here says your sins are forgiven. But, but think of this though. This is so powerful because it would have been assumed in this particular time period that the reason why the man was paralyzed was because of his sins. That was a very commonly held cultural standard in that time is that if you had some type of physical ailment, it was because of your sins or the sins of your fathers. And so you deserved to be paralyzed. You deserved to be blind. You deserved to be lame. Any possible physical ailment or disease, you deserve to have that because it's God's punishment on you for either your sins or the sins of your forefathers. And because that's the cultural standard, Jesus begins with that. Jesus begins there, he's like, this man has been outcast and has not been included in the list, not just because he can't walk. He's been not included in the list because it's assumed that he is from a sinful family or he himself is a sinner. And so Jesus forgiving him his sins is not just a spiritual healing, which is the most important part of the story, it's also a social healing. He's saying to this man, your sins and the sins of your family are not something that keep you from my kingdom. Verse four, Jesus is now coming back at the, the Pharisees. Because the Pharisees basically ask this question, how is this one allowed to be on the team? How is Jesus allowed on the team, but how is the paralyzed man allowed on the team? It says this in verse four. Knowing their hearts, Jesus said, why do you entertain evil thoughts in your hearts? Which is easier, to say your sins are forgiven or to say get up and walk? but I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the paralyzed man, get up, take your mat, and go home. Interesting, the only reason Jesus healed the guy in the end physically is just to prove that he had the authority to forgive sins. He's displaying that to be spiritually whole is way, way more important than ever being physically whole. But he makes the man physically whole to show him this man is a part of us. This man is allowed to be in our group. Then verse eight, when the crowd saw this, they were filled with awe and they praised God who had given such authority to this man. And so right here we see that Jesus gathers the helpless. And those are not typically the people that we would include in the list. The Pharisees are really confused by this because as we know, as Western Americans, God helps those who help themselves, right? It's scriptural. No, it's not. That's a lie. Please don't tweet that. God helps the helpless. God gathers the helpless. But in their understanding of who gets to be included, the only people that get to be included, the only people that God would gather are those that have some type of value themselves. But we find in this first passage that God gathers even those who cannot physically get themselves into the presence of Christ. Moving on in verse nine, this is a passage that most of you will be familiar with. As Jesus went from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth, said, follow me, he told them. Matthew got up and followed him. While Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, here it is again, they understand why the religious elite would be welcome at a dinner with Jesus. If Jesus were sitting around and just meeting with all of the pastors and all of the key church members, they would be like, yeah, that checks out. But Jesus is not eating with those people. Jesus was eating with the people with, that had nothing to do with the church. Jesus was eating with the people that were actually robbing the church. That's what Matthew was. He was a tax collector, but really probably more accurately, he was just a thief. He was stealing from other Jews. That's what tax collectors did. And so Jesus didn't come in and just meet with the good church people. No, Jesus sat down and had a meal with the sinners and the tax collectors. So verse 11, when the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners. On hearing this, Jesus said, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have not come to call the righteous, but the sinners. Jesus is not giving them permission to continue sinning. That's not what is happening in this passage. It's not saying that sin does not exist. 
It's saying that your past sins do not matter in terms of whether or not you are welcome at the table. And so that's what Jesus is exemplifying here. He says, I didn't come to call the righteous. The righteous are already righteous. I came to call the sinner that they might become righteous. But of course, the Pharisees, they don't get that. They, they sit there and they look at Matthew and the tax collectors and the sinners and they think, they've done way too many things to be included in this particular group. They've done way too many things in their past for them to be a part of us. He says this, he says, he says in verse 13, but go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. What he's saying is, I desire for you to have a forgiving heart towards other people more than you do your religious practices. You can show up to church every single week. You can park in the same parking spot, which most of you do. I see your cars. I know where you park. You can show up at the same service. You can go to the same small group. You can tithe in recurring giving online. You can go to your small group on Wednesday or Tuesdays. You can show up and volunteer in the children's ministry or student ministry. You can go to your small group on Sunday nights. You can volunteer in VBS. You can go on the mission trip. You can do all of those things, all of those religious practices, but they are meaningless if you do not have mercy. That's what Jesus is saying. If you will not give people a second chance, you are missing the boat. And so Jesus here is demonstrating for us that he gathers the sinners. And this one applies to all of us. We may not have all experienced everything we're going to go through this morning in the passage, but we've all been that. We have all at some point been in our lives unworthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. But he gathers us anyways for we were spiritually sick and Jesus came to reach the spiritually sick. Verse 14 goes on. <clears throat> it says, then John's disciples came, <clears throat> excuse me. Then John's disciples came and asked him, how is it that we and the Pharisees fast often, but your disciples do not fast? How is it that we, the religious elite, do all the right things? We go to practice. Using our sports analogy again, of course the people that go to practice should be the ones that get picked for the roster. Of course the people that show up to church at the same time every week should get to be on the roster. Of course the people that serve on all of the committees should get to be on the roster. Of course the people that pray all the right prayers, that know all of the creeds, that know every word to every song that we sing without needing lyrics on the screen. Of course those people should be included. But they're wondering, they're like, why on earth would you include people that have not bought into our particular religious practices. And Jesus is not here saying that fasting is not valuable, just like any of the things I've just named are not valuable. They were very valuable. But what this passage is saying is that your religion is not the thing that gets you into heaven. And Jesus responds this way, verse 15. Jesus answered, how can the guests of the bridegroom mourn while he's still with them? What he's setting up for them is saying, I'm still with you. What you need to understand, I, Jesus, I am still with you, but I'm only gonna be here for a short time. And so, so that you don't get distracted by all of the religious dogma and practices that came before me, my followers aren't going to do them for a season because I don't want them to think that this is just an addendum. I don't want to think that just following Jesus is just a slight change of course. There is page upon page upon page upon page that they had received in prior generations that said, these are the things you're supposed to do to be a good follower of God. And Jesus is saying, I'm gonna put some of those practices on hold. That's what he means. When he says, the bridegroom is with you for a little while. He's saying, I don't want you to get distracted by thinking that the practices are the actual forgiveness and salvation themselves. So, it goes on. The time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them. Then they will fast. So you see, Again, religious practices are great. Reading your Bible is great. Prayer is great. Coming to church is great. Being a small group is great. Tithing is great. Serving is great. All those things are wonderful, but they are not the things that get you into the kingdom. They are not the things that get you into a restored relationship with Christ because that only, as the previous passage says, comes through God's mercy. And he says this in verse 16. No one sews a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment for the patch will pull away from the garment, making the tear worse. Neither do people pour new wine into old wineskins. If they do, the skins will burst. 
The wine will run out and the wine skins will be ruined. No, they pour new wine into new wine skins and both are preserved. Jesus is saying, I'm coming to create an entirely new paradigm. I'm not just here to adjust your thinking. I'm not just here to say, well, just add in a few of these things and subtract out a few of those things and then we've got religion 2.0. That's not the goal. He's creating an entire new system. That's what he means by using new wine and new wineskins. Jesus is saying, you're gonna have to do this new. And so what he's demonstrating in this passage is that Jesus gathers the non-religious. It can be a really big roadblock for a lot of people coming to church or getting into some type of group in a church that they're not religious enough for that group. I have this conversation with men all the time that are starting to come to a men's group that I lead on Wednesday nights. We'll have a new guy come and join our group and I'll I'll try and go to breakfast with them if I can if they're joining our group for the first time. And the thing I always want to drill into them is there's a lot of guys that are in my men's group that have studied this for a long time. None of them have the whole thing memorized and none of them do it perfectly, including me. But we have been studying it for a while and so there's going to be times in which people say things that you don't understand. There's gonna be times in which we might ask a theological question that you haven't even heard that word before. Please don't let that be the reason you don't come to the group. Ask questions, but also hear me tell you this as the group leader, if you need to sit there for two months and not say a word other than just listen, I want you to know that you're welcome even though you don't have a religious background. And that's a really big roadblock, especially for men. We like to have the answers. And so what I'm trying to share with them is this same passage that Jesus has, you don't have to be religious to be gathered to Christ. You don't have to have had all of the Sunday school answers growing up. You don't have to know how to explain every little theological concept to be welcome at the table. So we see that God gathers, Jesus gathers the non-religious. And that's incredibly important for us. I'm sure at different points in our walks, we have all been a part of some type of Christian group where we maybe just didn't feel like we were worthy enough to be there. We didn't feel like we had all of the right answers. We didn't feel like we had our own strong enough faith story. Or we were still trying to figure out really what church meant for us and what our place was in the church. And because of that, we kept it at arm's distance. Right here though, Jesus is saying, come and follow me first. You can learn the religious stuff later because the religious stuff is not what gets you in in the first place. So Jesus gathers the non-religious. Then the passage goes on in verse 18, and there's two stories interwoven in this next section. It says, while he was saying this, a synagogue leader came and knelt before him and said, my daughter has just died, but come put your hand on her and she will live. Jesus got up and went with him, and so did his disciples. Go back to you so you can catch this, verse 18. While he was saying this, a synagogue leader came and knelt before him. One of the religious leaders, the same group that's criticizing Jesus and wondering why certain people are allowed to be on the team that they don't deem valuable, one of those people is now coming to Jesus and saying, Jesus, my daughter's died and I don't know where else to turn. You have to think he had exhausted all of his options. Again, there's lots of information in here on what you were supposed to do when someone died. There was lots of different practices that you would go through to heal someone, to anoint someone, all types of different religious things that were supposed to lead to healing. And you've gotta think a synagogue leader would have exhausted all of those. And so at this point, it's quite literally a Hail Mary moment. He is just hoping beyond hope that this last ditch effort of going to Jesus and saying, maybe, maybe this guy will let me in. You've gotta think at this point, this person's faith is probably deconstructed just a little bit. His daughter has died and the religion that he had followed for his entire life had not brought her back to life. So at this point, he was probably quite hopeless. Then another story gets woven into this beginning in verse 20. Just then, a woman who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years came up behind him and touched the edge of his cloak. She said to herself, if I only touch his cloak, I will be healed. Jesus turned and saw her. Take heart, daughter, he said. Your faith has healed you, and the woman was healed at that moment. It's a miracle that she had been bleeding for 12 years and that Jesus healed her on the spot. Absolutely, that's a miracle. The greater miracle though is that she was restored back into the fold. We don't excommunicate people because they have physical ailments anymore. 
We don't ostracize people because they have diseases. We don't ostracize people because they're sick. We don't put them out there away from the community. Then you did. If you had some kind of physical issue like that, if she'd been bleeding for 12 years, she wasn't just physically hurt, she was alone. She wouldn't have had a family. She wouldn't have been a part of the community. She wouldn't have been considered an an insider. And so for her, when she's going to Jesus, it's more than just, can you heal my physical ailment? She's going to Jesus saying, I'm so lonely. Can I please, please be a part of this thing? Can I please, please be a part of this gathering? And so we see inside of this passage that Jesus gathers the hopeless and the lonely. Verse 23, when Jesus entered the synagogue leader's house and saw the noisy crowd and people playing pipes, he said, go away, the girl is not dead but asleep. But they laughed at him. After the crowd had been put outside, he went in and took the girl by the hand and she got up. News of this spread through all the region. So you have a religious leader. Dude grew up going to church. He went to every small group. He served on every committee. He he volunteered, he gave his time. He prayed all the right prayers, he read all of the right scriptures, and his daughter still died. We've all been there. If you've grown up in church and followed God long enough, at some point you've thought to yourself, but God, I've, I've done what you asked me to. I checked all the boxes. I did all the right things. And you get to this place of maybe hope doesn't exist anymore. And you have to wonder if that synagogue leader had begun to question his own faith because he had probably exhausted everything by that point. And so Jesus gathers the hopeless but then the woman that had been bleeding for 12 years, not just her physical ailment, but her ostracization from society, Jesus heals that. Have we all not felt alone at different spaces? Have we all not felt like we were doing this journey called life by ourselves? And Jesus gathers those people. The Pharisees would have said, yeah, she's not one of us. She hasn't been coming to temple. Well, she didn't come because you wouldn't let her. It's a really weird double standard. But they would have said, no, you can't be a part of our group. And so they're really surprised at how Jesus can allow her in. Verse 27, our final narrative passage. It says, and Jesus went on from there. Two blind men followed him, calling out, have mercy on us, son of David. When he had gone indoors, the blind men came to him and he asked them, do you believe that I am able to do this? Yes, Lord, they replied. Then he touched their eyes and said, according to your faith, again, this is very different than what it would have been before. Before Jesus, it would not have been according to your faith. It would have said, according to X, Y, and Z that you just did, the the healing practice, the anointment, all of these types of things. It's important here. Jesus says, because of your faith, it has been done. And their sight was restored, and Jesus warned them sternly. See that no one knows about this. But they went out and spread the news about him all over the region anyways. Wouldn't you? If you couldn't see your whole life, and then all of a sudden some dude healed you, I think you would tell people. It's a secret that you wouldn't keep. Verse 32, while they were going out, a man who was demon-possessed, could not talk, who could not talk, was brought to Jesus. And when the demon was driven out, the man who had been mute spoke. The crowd was amazed and said, nothing like this has ever been seen in Israel. But the Pharisees said, and here's their hand grenade they throw at the very end. But the Pharisees said, it is by the prince of demons that he drives out demons. Saying that Jesus has just healed blind people. He's just removed a demon, an impure spirit from man, and made him be able to speak again. And they're like, we are tired of Jesus letting in the people that aren't supposed to be here. We're tired of Jesus gathering the people to him that we have not deemed valuable in being here. And so you know what? We're gonna lob that last little thing over the fence, and we're gonna call him the devil. We haven't really made it far as a society. When someone disagrees with us, it's really easy just to call them Satan. Satan. It's a wonderful verbal hand grenade to throw over the fence because those people over there don't fit our description of who we think should be included in the kingdom of God. But here what we find is that Jesus gathers the blind and the silenced. This man had been silenced by a demon. He had no voice of his own and Jesus gathers him too. Again, the color commentators of the day, the Pharisees, would not have liked that. You're not allowed to tell them that they're in. That guy can't speak. It means he's never been able to even say the right words. How on earth should he be allowed to be a part of our group? 
And so the beauty of this this morning is that Jesus gathers all of us. At Matthew chapter nine, here's what you should find first and foremost is yourself. (laughs) Because at some point in your life, you've probably felt helpless. You've probably felt down on the mat and you could not even get yourself to feel like you were in the presence of God on your own. But Jesus gathered you anyways. At some point, we know this from scripture, all have fallen short of the glory of God and are sinners. So we're all guilty of the second one. We all are guilty of things that absolutely should prevent us from being a part of the kingdom. We've all done things that absolutely should exclude us from Christ's presence. But he gathers us to him anyways. Probably many of us have experienced different phases where we didn't feel like we had the right religion. I tell this to college kids all the time. Like, listen, if you go off to college and don't find a church on Sunday mornings, but you find a small group on Thursday nights, that's awesome. That doesn't mean that you left the church as all the statistics say. It just means that your church moved to Thursday nights. That's all it was. And so don't let people's religious dogma get in the way of you feeling like you're not a part of the group. And so even if you don't come from a religious background, even if you don't come from a particular denominational background, Jesus has gathered you in that lack of religion to him. We've probably all felt seasons of hopelessness and loneliness. We've all had seasons where we were blind and we were going the wrong way even though we couldn't see it. And we probably all even felt at times that we didn't have the words to say. And so the the sugar in this, the beauty in this passage is that Jesus gathers all of us. But just like Mary Poppins says, a spoonful of sugar helps the what? Medicine go down. So time for your medicine. Verse 35. Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. What Jesus is saying is this. There are so many helpless people out there. There are so many people trapped in a life of sin that is leading them nowhere. There are so many people that don't have the right religious words to feel like they're even comfortable walking into a place like this. There are so many people who, even if they had a faith life as a child, so many things have happened in their life, they have lost all hope. There are so many people that are lonely, that are blind, that are silenced, but there's not enough workers. There's too many people focused on those that have already been gathered, and there's not nearly enough workers going out and getting the people that need to. And so what Jesus is saying in this moment, verse 38, Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. And so the sugar this morning is that Jesus gathers all of us. But the medicine this morning is that Jesus calls all of us to gather all of them. And the proverbial them is a whole big word. That's them as in the people that didn't grow up like you did, the people that look different than you the people that have different worldviews and political ideologies than you do. What it's saying is that we are called to gather all of them, all of the people that we might deem not worthy enough to be on the list. Jesus is saying in verse 38, ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. And so our calling as a church is to gather everyone to Christ.